Jonathan Brown. We can welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us. Analytics in Action by Association Analytics. We're going to give it just a minute to get started. Let us know where you're calling in from. If you have any fun for the July plan. Somebody else in the storm here. Anybody on the call here doing anything fun for Fourth of July? Greg, you're doing something fun. Bristol, Tennessee, baby. Deep Creek Lake. All right. Greg, what are you racing? Uh, Mazda Miata. Fantastic. Super pumped. We got it on the trailer and then it started to rain seconds later. So perfect timing here. And we got a lot of people here. We got a lot of familiar faces, but there's a lot of names I don't recognize. Shout out to Annette. Welcome. Well, so I see Barb's on here. Welcome. We're excited to have you. get started here. Thanks everyone for joining us. I'm Patrine McAfee. I'm the Director of Growth Marketing here at Association Analytics. And today, let me see if I can get my slide to move. <laughs> um, you have your normal hosts of the Analytics in Action series, Bill Comporti, SVP of Strategy and Solutions, and Greg Pollock, SVP of Sales. Um, we have an extra special guest today, Connor. He is our CTO. He has been in the association industry for a very long time. I won't say the years. Uh, he comes to us from uh, Higher Logic. You were there what, 11, 12 years? Yeah, crazy. And then um, uh, right before joining A2, he was at uh, Cloud Generation. Super excited to have him on board. I think he's been here maybe two months now. Um, total tech nerd. I don't think he would be offended by that term. And uh, AI expert, which is why we have him here. Um, and I am going to turn it over to uh, Bill to get started. Okay. Uh, thanks, Katrina. Yeah, so we have a... Uh, oh, sorry. I'm just going along here and I forgot to share my screen. That's, I've done this before, guys. I really have. That crazy good energy with the music and Connor's here. Yeah. That's all right. Okay. Bill, we're going to have to replace you with AI, dude. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Yeah. So, uh, so we're going to be talking about AI today. There's uh, no shortage of content on that topic uh, these days. So we're going to try to do it in a, in a bit of a novel way. We'll cover some of the same stuff, right? We'll, we'll cover a little bit of the terminology, give you that kind of primer um, to get you started. But most of it's going to be talking about how it's going to affect all of us as association pros and what we need to do um, to prepare for it. So Katrina mentioned, uh, lucky enough to have Connor um, on with us today. So he's an expert in all this stuff. And Greg and I will just be there, just kind of like put some guardrails on it so we don't get too deep uh, in the technical stuff and um, get above everyone's head. So uh, raw data to Real Insights, uh, preparing your association for AI. Let's do it. Awesome. So as Bill said, we're here to translate some of this for the humans so you can have some key takeaways. I've been to a lot of AI sessions recently and I walk out of them and I feel like I have no idea what I learned or what I'm supposed to do with any of that. Our goal today is to give you some actual things that you learned. You can have reasonable conversations with your peers and to give you some takeaways that you can put into action in the next couple hours, weeks, days. So we're going to do some intros and polls. We're going to ask you some questions about how you feel about it. We'd love to hear from you in the chat about how you're thinking about AI. We'll give you some setup, like what are the terms you should know? What are the major themes out there when people use terms like a model? What are they talking about? We'll talk about the impacts that this is having on your members right now, because it is. AI is not coming. AI is here. Your members are using it. It's a competitor out there in the marketplace. Um, we're going to talk about how you can sort of evolve with AI, right? If you don't want to build a large language model tomorrow, how do I start dipping my toe in the water? How do I get better at prompt engineering? What is prompt engineering? We'll talk all about that. We'll give you some concrete takeaways on how you can apply that today. 
why are we presenting this? Um, it's in the name, Association Analytics, right? We are the data people. So having all of your data in one centralized location is a really good starting point to using AI and predictive analytic models, building your own large language model. And that's exactly what we do. So we have 20 years of experience in helping associations centralize all their data into a data warehouse, build visualizations so they can explore the data, so they can build better prompts, um, create models like predictive analytics and engagement scoring to start using that data to create insights. And then obviously taking all of that and feeding it to AI models so you can start using it to do all this fun stuff we're about to talk about. Awesome, thanks, Greg. Um, so look, we have a lot of people on today. All right, this is a, a big topic, a lot of interest in this. So uh, I wanna ask for your uh, participation, right? There's gonna be a bunch of times and we're gonna ask for your experience, ask for your thoughts, things like that. And we're gonna do that mostly informally, but uh, one formal one, we'll start with a poll and we're just gonna start right at the beginning, right? Which of these best describes how you're currently feeling about AI, right? You're really scared, hey, a little bit worried. You don't really care, you're not, uh, you're disinterested. Maybe this is not the right webinar for you if that's where you are. Um, are you hopeful or all in, right? There's a few of us that are already all in. Let's give a minute to think about it. I'm all in because this is all being recorded and when the AIs take over, I need them to know that. <laughs> I've been all in since the beginning. That's right, that's right. You gonna make sure the age as well, right? Also, I noticed there was a post on Collaborate about people being worried about AI. So hopefully some of those people are here. We can talk through some of the, the reasons not to be as concerned, or maybe you should be concerned. And if you are concerned, what sort of things are you going to do to mitigate that concern? Are there policies and um, procedures you can put in place for your staff or for your members or for your partners in the industry? Are there, is there policy statements you should come out with? Um, all of that's where you can be a leader. Okay, uh, I'm gonna go through the results really fast. And this is really just for the benefit of those that'll watch the recording later. So good news, only had 3%, just a small handful of people that are really scared, right? So um, that's not us, right? So we're not so scared. A little worried, uh, about just under 20% are a little worried. And interestingly enough, that's about the same percentage that are all in. So a little worried and all in around 20% each. 10%, um, uh, give or take, are neutral. They're disinterested. Uh, we're going to change that, right? You're going to have an opinion after um, after today's webinar. So um, if you um, if you said neutral or disinterested, um, curious, right? Uh, give us some some of your thoughts in in the chat. Like, why did you choose that one? A lot of us are hopeful, right? Over half of us are in hopeful. It's like, hey, you know, we should uh, be a little cautious about this, but we think ultimately it's going to be a good thing. I think that's probably where I am if I were taking the poll. Um, and then 20% uh, are all in. So guys, uh, Connor, Greg, what uh, what do you think? Anything surprising here? Well, the, the thing that I wonder is what people are really scared and a little bit worried about, uh, because there's so many different things you could be a little bit scared or really worried about. Like, did, can, can anybody basically put in the chat accuracy? Yeah. Okay. That's so, legit, right? yeah. Are, are you worried about? So, you know, it's kind of funny, funny when people start talking about accuracy, because this is the first time that you're you're interacting with a uh like a system that's giving you an answer rather than interacting with a system like google search where you're going to a web page how often have people gone to a blog and then read a blog and been like that was completely fabricated <laughs> yeah i mean I, so the, the reason why the, the reason why i'm not so worried about accuracy is that all of us have got uh, have had to use mental models for years when we go to like consume content and realize that maybe all of this stuff isn't completely factual so uh, I'm not I'm not super worried about it from that perspective. Yeah, that's not going to go away. Um, someone in the in the chat here said depth of expertise. Um, we're going to talk so, about that a little bit later. But what are your quick thoughts on that? Uh, so depth of expertise, I think it's actually probably going to go the opposite direction. People are going to be freed up to spend more time thinking strategically about what they need to be accomplishing rather than having to do the tactical stuff. The way that I. Uh, the, the way that I've been using tools so far uh, in, in my daily life is like an engineer. I've been basically just like talking to, um, there's this tool called uh, Copilot and I basically talk to it in the form of like, you know, high level direction. And then it writes code. It's saving me maybe like an hour to two hours a day. Uh, so I'm, I'm uh, that time that's saved, uh, that's being saved. I'm actually using it to think more rather than like have to deal with the, uh, like, you know, the nitty gritty. 
And so as far as like expertise, I think people are going to be freed up to spend more time getting deeper on the T scale. All right. Um, cool. Thanks, Connor. Yeah. So Greg mentioned that uh, thread and collaborate. It's just called AI worries and it's in the executive uh, section on collaborate. So go ahead and find that um, if you're interested. There's some, um, I think, some novel takes on things that you might uh, uh, want to um, at least think about, right? I wouldn't, I won't even say you should be worried about them, but there are definitely things that you can, uh, consider. Okay. So with that, um, I, I, guys, I could spend the whole day talking about all this stuff. I wish we could like turn the videos on for everybody because there's a lot of good stuff in here. I mean, everything from like theft of IP, like, uh, Google for years has been stealing your IP. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, like theft of personal information. Like there's all sorts of really interesting stuff that's like happening right now in the in the EU related to AI. Uh, yeah, the, uh, the I don't want to yeah. suck up. So look, I mean, at, at awesome. the very least, I think, it, you know, if it's not clear already, we're kind of coming at this from a from the hopeful side, right? Our perspective is that it's more of an opportunity than it is a risk. Um, but, you know, if even if you're not worried about all of these things, right, that that people are putting in the chat, you should at the very least be highly aware of them, right, as we, as we go forward. So um, thank you all for your input and uh, more to come, right? We're going to be asking for it throughout. Uh, okay, so here's some terminology. You know, we could, you could probably spend the whole hour just uh, defining these terms. So I'm going to take a shot at going through really fast and giving you layman's uh, definitions of these terms. And you've probably seen, you know, just about um, all of these. So so generally speaking, the AI starts with the data set. The data set can be different formats. It could be uh, uh, videos, could be images. Uh, most of the popular tools and the ones that we'll talk about today use text or text and code uh, data sets. Um, and the data sets are used to train the model. Okay, so what's the model? So the model is the representation, the mathematical representation of the training data. And what the model does is it learns the patterns in the data and that's what allows it to generate responses, right? To, um, to you know, predict you know what should uh, what should come next. Essentially, um, the one type of model, the most common type that uh, we're all aware of, is called the LLM or the Large Language Model. And this one is trained on this massive data set of text, like the public internet, you know, for example. And the the goal of these things is to to present. Uh, responses in kind of human language, right? So it's meant to be uh, conversational. Um, so one one specific LLM or uh, kind of a subset is uh, GPT. This was the first one that was mainstream. This was uh, developed by OpenAI, right? Or Chat, you know, Chat GPT. Probably heard of that. Uh, that was was in 2018. And when you're interacting with these models, you have to use prompts, right? So prompt is what is the input. Or like the query or the search, you know, something like that. The response is the answer you get. We're going to look at a, a lot of those today. And the last term, there's a lot more that we could get into, but hallucination, right? So sometimes the AI just makes stuff up, right? What uh, is this uh, something we should be worried about, Connor? Hallucinations? Uh, that's actually probably the stuff that I'm most worried about. <laughs> uh, th there's been some really interesting stuff where, uh, you know, when people have been asked, to uh, work on basically research papers and create citations. There's been citations that have been created that have, that have been complete hallucinations. There's uh, there's all sorts of like, you know, really bad things that could lead to uh, people having a complete misrepresentation of the truth. Uh, because it's because when when these LLMs hallucinate, they hallucinate really well. Yeah. And and one form of hallucination that I've seen, that, which is which is really strange. Uh, if anybody's seen any images out there that have been created, uh, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of work in 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 the training sets that were done uh, that were utilized the you know the data sets. Uh, there was a lot of work that was done on making faces really good, but uh, take a look out there for examples of hands. Uh, AIs are really bad at generating hands right now, and and there's some really creepy hallucinations that you can see <laughs> if you if you look for those. Um, so so that's kind of funny, but. Um, if we loop back to some of the terminology, so when, when we're talking about AI, what we're what we've had is a bunch of engineers for a long time trying to come up with basically like systems that think like humans, and and when I start thinking about uh, you know some of these some of these terms from the standpoint of like uh, like how how does a human learn, 
some of this stuff makes a little bit more sense. So I think of like, you know, a data set being like the books that you would give to a bunch of students as they were trying to learn a topic. If you didn't end up giving a book to somebody on like some component of math, they wouldn't know it. Uh, same thing with the AI. So if you give the uh, if you give the AI, and we'll go over this in a in a future slide, you give the AI a data set that's composed of Reddit and Twitter, there's a strong possibility that some of the information that's going to be used and then recalled by the model in the future is going to be controversial, yeah. to say the least. <laughs> so, so the AI can uh, either hallucinate or can tell you things based upon the information that it was trained on that's potentially really negative, right? And so you have to be very careful about understanding what data set was utilized to train a model, right? So think of like, you know, the data set as the books, the model as the, uh, you know, the, the, the certificate or the credential that you get when you leave like you know, university. And so you'd give a different data set to train a software engineer than a different data set than train a medical professional or a lawyer or someone else like that. So, you know, data set matters a lot. And, and we can talk about how, like, you know, later on, uh, you know, how you can prepare your data to be used as a data set to train things that could be the legal model of the future or the medical model of the future. Um, uh, and then, you know, prompt engineering, we can talk about some of this kind of stuff a little bit later on. I don't want to spend too much time on these topics. All right. Awesome. So, so really quick and, and, and we want to move on, but, and I think a lot of people are, are familiar with this story, but Greg, get, tell us about the, the lawyer, the lawyers and the hallucination um, quickly, and you guys can look it up uh, offline if you, if you want to learn more about it. Yeah, so there's a really good example of a, a lawsuit that happened and a couple lawyers used a LLM GPT model to submit their legal brief. And the challenge is it had hallucinations, but it cited specific case law in those hallucinations. Um, if you want to get, there's a really good YouTube video by Legal Eagle about this where he breaks it all down for you. But they submitted this brief to the court and it had page, chapter, here's this court case had this outcome and, and this happened. And that's why we're submitting this legal brief that our client can sue in this jurisdiction. And it was all just hallucinated and made up. And these guys got in a lot of trouble. So you'll see some examples today where, where these models are succeeding and doing some really cool things. But you'll also see some examples today where these models are failing um, and people are getting in trouble with that. And that's a really important part of this conversation is it's a tool. It can be used for good. It can be used incorrectly. It can be used specifically to do bad things. It's not the tool's fault, right? It's how you're asking the tool to do things. It's the model, the books that the tool read when it grew up. It's how that model's been trained. And part of our job is to understand if our members are potentially using these models, what's the right way to do it? What's the ethical way to do it? And a couple of people in here in the chat already mentioned like giving too much information to the model. Right. If you're giving all this proprietary information to the model when you're prompting it, like you're just giving away this free information. That's not maybe the best policy to have. So there's some some good, some bad, some wins and some losses. It's not the tool's fault that any of these are happening. It's us, the humans, on how we use the tool. Awesome. Well said. OK, uh, let's move on to uh, tools. So there's a there's a bunch. So kind of give us a sense for the the landscape. Right. What's important to know about this stuff? All right. So there's a lot of people that think that chat GPT is the only thing it's is the bee's knees and the only thing that's like you know ever happened in the world of AI. If you look at the left column, uh, these are the different models. And then uh, if you end up looking at the date, the date that they were announced, like look at the dates of those. They're all in 2023. If we click on, um, uh, are, are we going to send out this presentation, Bill? Uh, yeah, yeah, they're they're uh, they're always available. I mean, the recording's okay. available, and then we can send out the slides too. Sure. Cool. So I love this spreadsheet because this spreadsheet has got a number of tabs and you can get lost in this if you're an AI nerd for days. But uh, if you scroll down, you can just see the date that these models were announced. So, Bill, if you just scroll down a little bit for, you know, further, keep going. Look, look at look at how recent all of this activity has been. So uh, and, and this is going to go to the point that I was going to make in a little bit that each of these different tools, they're being like, they're being created and updated in front of us, right? This is a very fast changing world. So people need to not get focused on, you know, chat GPT is the best or BARD or Bing. They're all leapfrogging each other. And there's a number of different like tools and services out there that you could use that could be completely better at a specific task than one of these large language models. So back to that like analogy earlier on about 
uh, like a model being kind of like a credential or certificate where like, you know, someone could have, uh, so someone could be like, uh, someone could have trained a model around medicine or someone could have trained a model around, uh, you know, engineering. The more specific the model gets, the more specific the training set is, the, the better outcomes you'll have. Right now, these large language models, they've been trained on absolutely everything and they're getting people to, to try to do anything with them. And it's amazing to me that, that, that with the generality of the inputs, people are getting like, you know, really good outputs. But there's very specific models that I think that people are going to want in the future for medical, for legal purposes, for financial purposes. And, and we can talk about this later on, but it's it's 100 where i think the association should be focusing on because you guys have this amazing data sitting inside of your organizations that you could use in the form of data sets to train these things so uh you know bill is there anything specific else that you want to talk about related to this slide there's so much stuff in here no, look I, I think you made the right points here right which is that there's massive growth um like there the developments are so fast that what's the best model today might not be the best one tomorrow. And that's a really good segue actually to a question that we had, which is how do I choose? Um, how do I know which one to use? So we have a couple of recommendations on there. First of all is start with these. These are the most popular. These are you know, the most accessible you know, for most of us. So um, what do you think, Rick? I tested each one of these out. I asked a bunch of questions. Here's my high level experience. They all give you a similar answers. It's just a different user experience. I think Bing is very good at search. Instead of using a search engine, just go use bing.com slash new. Um, it does want you to use Microsoft Edge. So if you're a, not an Edge user, you get a barrier to entry there. I thought ChatGPT was the most basic output. It gave me text, but I liked Bard the best. It gave me pictures. It gave me context. It summarized things in a really good way. Um, is that going to be the case tomorrow? Probably not, right? ChatGPT is supposed to have a huge update coming out. That's going to leapfrog it. I don't think it's the necessarily the tool you pick. I think it's how you use the tool, how you prompt it, how you interpret the answer you're getting. I also want to give a word of caution here, right? You're um, not the purchaser of the tool. You're part of the, the data acquisition strategy for them, right? As they answer questions, you're helping them be smarter. You're the As product. you answer questions, you're giving them more data. They're like, do you like answer A or answer B? Like you're testing their software for free. So use these, but just know that they're collecting data on you. And a lot of these are logged in. So if you're using Google Bard and you're logged in and you're asking it questions, you just told Google a ton of stuff about you that's going to show up on Google Maps and Google Search, and it's going to be in your ad in Gmail tomorrow. So as you're using these tools, um, just keep in mind that you're you know, part of the model, you're training the model, and you're feeding the, the model data. Yeah, All right, cool. It's, yeah, I mean, ahead, funny, traditionally, uh, when you went to a search engine, you would type... A, a long tail, like a highly specific, you know, set of like words so that you would get like a highly specific uh, blog, for instance, like nowadays, you're, you're gonna be going to an LLM. And the, uh, if you just typed in two long tail words, you're not going to get any kind of utility from the response, you need to explain to the, uh, you need to explain to the LLM, just like you'd explain to an expert. So just think of like the LLMs like a person, if you walked up to a person, and you said, complete my job for me. They'd be like, what job are you talking about? Like, <laughs> I need some context, right? And so, you know, context comes in the form of what questions you've asked in the past, uh, what you do for your job, uh, like how you operate on a daily basis. So the more information that you end up giving, the better results you'll get back. So there's some people that are of the opinion, the, the more information and the more consistently that I use one of these tools, the better results I'll get. But then that makes me feel uncomfortable. I mean, that, that then, like, you know, as Greg said, you've got Microsoft and Google and OpenAI knowing an incredible amount about you and about the organization you work for. So, because you're probably putting proprietary information from your organization into these engines. So you gotta be yeah. careful about that as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, great. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, there was a question um, asking, well, how do we know which tool to use? Well, that's interesting. Uh, there's an AI for that, right? This is an actual website. If you just type it in just like that, there's an AI for that.com, then um, it'll give you a list and it's kind of an inventory of current AIs and what they're good at. So highly recommend that you take a look at that. Okay. So let's, I would also uh, say, think about there's an AI for that's good because 
all, all these tools we've been talking about so far, you kind of think I ask a question, it gives me a text answer. Most of the tools don't do that. It's, hey, make a video on this. I want an image that looks like this. Take this video and turn it into text. Create a YouTube thumbnail for me, right? All of these other things that you might want AI to do are out there. And there's an AI for that's a good gateway into what are all these other applications of these lightweight tools. Yeah. Um, I saw some people talking about garbage in, garbage out. That's, of, of course, um, valid here. I saw one. I don't know if you guys have seen this. I, I thought it was interesting that maybe I'm the last one. But uh, people were using the acronym BIMBO. Bias in means bias out. Right. So I thought that was kind of a cool way to... Uh, um, Evan was bringing up the point about, you know, if your if your data sets are are biased in the first place, and obviously the results are going to uh, reflect that bias when they come back. Okay, um, so now we have this high level understanding, what is AI, the landscape, some of the tools and all that. So let's talk about how it's going to change things for us as association pros. So um, Connor did the did the talk at MMCC the other day, and and he broke it down into three ways, which I thought was really smart. So we've kind of copied that here, is how is it going to affect staff, like all of us in our jobs? How they going to affect our, how we deal with our members and and actually the mem or the members themselves and then uh, on the association and the industry uh, more broadly. So uh, let's jump into that. And as we do, I want to invite you to again come into the chat and just tell us, you know, are you using AI in your job? All right, any of that stuff that we've talked to, we've talked about a few examples so far, but are you doing any of that and are you actually using it uh, for your work yet? Okay, uh, so. Uh, awesome. Go for it. So now, just just to uh, tell you, we we kind of asked like the the three that we've recommended. So we've asked Bard, we've asked Bing, and we've asked um, ChatGPT. Um, these questions, right? So the prompt in each case is on the slide here, and you can kind of see the kind of answers that each one of them gave. And so I'm just gonna have uh, have Connor go through these and and give you a sense for um, what all this means. Not not so much the uh, the specific results, but more like, hey, what are the things you should be um, thinking about in terms of these these areas of impact. Yeah, so related to that term context that we used earlier on, you can see searching for how should association staff use AI. What I'd highly suggest doing is based upon the role that you are inside of the organization, I would add context to it with as a membership manager, as a person that is in marketing and not just in marketing, these are the kind of like job functions that I undertake on a daily basis. Uh, just the more information that you end up putting in, the better the answer is going to be. And so the impact of, uh, of AI on staff, I, I'd highly suggest like trying to see if you could take an, an hour out of every day of yours and then just use that as like a, just like a logical goal. It's like, what, what are the things that you just did like a time study where you're like, what do I spend my day doing? Just write that up. And then be like, okay, how much of this stuff could I automate? <laughs> uh, th these are examples of like, uh, you know, elements that, uh, that, that that people have cited that that then the LLMs like, you know, uh, ingested that could be drastically impacted that staff members do on a daily basis. Uh, membership management, communications, event planning, data analysis. Data analysis scares the crap out of me because, you know, that's that's something that's near and dear to my part as uh, to, to my heart is like a. a uh, as an engineer, right? Like uh, data analysis, software development, there's a lot of that stuff that's uh, going to be automated, but uh, is it going to be automated and my job is going to be like, uh, you know, gone or is it going to be automated and then I'm going to be able to use the AI almost like I've got my own staff. And so I'm looking at it from the glass half full side where I'm like, okay, I think I'm going to be able to get more done faster and I'm gonna have systems that then I can just apply frameworks and I can be like, okay, what is it that I do on an annual basis? What is it I do on a monthly basis? What is it I do, do on a weekly basis? And how much of this stuff can I just write down and then feed into an AI so that the AI does the stuff for me? So it's, it's almost like just putting in the calendar. These are the things that I do periodically. I gotta do all this stuff for my annual event. I gotta do all these things for my chapter events. I gotta send all of these pieces of marketing. We, uh, what, what got brought up earlier on was composing tweets, uh, podca podcast pr uh, promos, curating images. All of that stuff is in relation to uh, you know things that you're trying to market. I'm pretty sure that if you could create a template for now, here's just the title of the thing. Here's a couple of the pieces of information that you would feed in the form of context to uh, 
chat GPT, Bard, whatever, it could actually create the HTML for you. So how sexy is it if you've got a, a CMS and then you've just got something that you, that you save in a calendar where you're like, I invite myself next month when I'm doing this, I just take this text and I paste this in, edit a couple things, and then the prompts create the HTML for you, create the marketing messaging for you, uh, creates the multi-channel on Twitter, LinkedIn, and you even have like the names of the personas in there. You can put a bunch of context into, you know, some of these directions that you would give to an LLM and you can get a lot of your work automated. I mean, it's, yeah. it, it's kind of crazy what you, what, what you can accomplish when you start to think about like, how, what do I do frequently and how can I automate it? All right. Um, so look, we're not going to do this necessarily for each one, but, you know, to, to bring home the point, you know, about how we should kind of be using uh, maybe some combination of these and understanding that they're different. Um, and so this, this answer from being, I, I didn't find it particularly relevant, you know, to the question. Um, it's, uh, you know, this last part here where they're talking about taking on important technical tasks is kind of interesting that to Connor's point now, but generally speaking, this one, I didn't find particularly relevant. Now, if we look at BARD, they have some examples from specific associations, right? So what if you worked for one of those and you see your association coming up in the, um, in the, in the, uh, uh chat results from an AI, I mean, well, how did it get that, right? I mean, that's probably from some case study or something that some vendor put uh, on their site. Um, but anyway, the point is, is like, it's, you know, that stuff is out there and it's part of, in its training uh, AIs that other people are using, which is a bit weird, right? Uh, but generally speaking, I thought this was probably the best one examples from specific association, um, this idea of personalizing member experiences, um, streamlining operations, et cetera. I think that stuff is is pretty good. And then we had the uh, open AI. So, I think generally these are, this is a good list, but it kind of seemed to me like they just took all the things associations do and said, um, AI can help, you know, you know what I mean? And so it's probably not, you probably didn't learn anything uh, new on this, but nevertheless, if you're thinking about this topic and you wanted to get started, um, this is good. So there's a lot of lessons here, right? It's going to affect all of us. Uh, that's number one. Number two is, you know, these, these models are different, kind of use them. And then probably this is maybe not the best prompt in the first place, right? I mean, it should have more context and we could have been more specific and probably got a better result. Okay, oh, so next. So can we go back for one second? Cause I, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll steal five minutes from my talk later to answer this and Connor can help. And then maybe anybody in the chat can help. I don't know the answer. We've got a question here. How can I avoid giving away too much sensitive information while using the tool? Someone else talked about a data control mode where you can disable saving input. So my question here is, if I'm inputting lots of exciting, potentially proprietary information into a tool to get helpful insights back, what is there a policy? Should my association have a, a prompt policy on what information we can and can't share? How do we use the tool successfully, but not give away trade secrets? The best thing you can do is have a conversation internally about the risks, like whether the organization views the information that you would be feeding into the uh, AI is proprietary. If it isn't, share it, <laughs> right? So uh, um, if it is, then then people should think about like what data is sensitive, what stuff do we not want to have uh, being shared with these large organizations? Because there's there's a strong possibility that an AI could be competitive to an association in the future. Because if if most of your members are looking to you for you know education and like you know being this like thought leader and they don't have to look to you anymore because all of that information is now stored inside of an ai do, do you want to i mean that's like that's like giving the keys to your house yeah. uh right yeah so i think i think it's maybe um a little bit early on this specific topic but uh, i know there's big interest in in this and and i think that's something we can address on a on a later episode this sounds like a panel discussion with some uh, association executives uh, at some point. So thank you for the for the question. Um, okay, so I think this one is really interesting and and maybe it's not the first thing that you, th you think of, but probably it should be, which is how is a AI gonna affect your members and what kinds of opportunities um, does that present? Any thoughts on that, Greg? Yeah, I mean, I think the AI affecting our members is key, right? They're probably gonna adopt this at a rapid pace and we probably don't have a whole lot of control over it. So this is where I think as an association, we can come up with policy statements, we can come up with 
generally accepted practices, recommendations on how to use it successfully, and warnings and cautions on how not to use it. We, we've got some examples in our slide deck today where AI is passing the bar at different states. Well, if it can do that, why can't it write a legal brief? And then at the same time, we have an example of AI writing a legal brief that hallucinates and makes stuff up. So how am I as a lawyer supposed to use AI to help me do my job? What's the best practice for me? I think as an association right now, creating those broad policy statements and saying, here's what we recommend, here's what we think you should do or not do, I think that's where we can be thought leaders. I don't think we can tell them not to use the tool at all. That's not going to work, right? I think what we can tell them is here's the safe way to use it. Here's the smart thing to do. And here are the concerns that are real. Giving away sensitive information, talking about, you know, confidential information between you and your client and putting it into chat GPT and the prosecutors over here reading all the things you've been saying, like that's probably not the best use of it. So I think our members are going to use it to do their jobs, to be more successful, and we can help recommend them how to do that. Now, interestingly enough, when we were preparing for this, we were talking about lawyers and CPAs and and Bill brought up the question, well, like, what if our members are ditch diggers? Like, how are they using API or chat GPT to do their job better? So I think it's going to impact different industries differently. If your members get certified, if your members um, have some sort of pass the bar, pass this test to be a member, this level of knowledge is going to be easier for people to access. That barrier to entry is going to come down and I can just go on chat GPT and pretend I'm a lawyer pretty quickly. So I think that's going to be something to consider. What your members do is going to be different on how AI is going to impact their jobs. Yeah, Greg, Greg stayed at a Holiday Inn last night, so he'll write your legal brief for you. <laughs> exactly. All right. Um, so, so, Connor, tell us about the impact of, uh, of AI on on members. Uh, yeah. So, 1980s hits uh, mechanization via like you know robotics completely blows up a uh, majority of like blue collar jobs inside of the United States we can drive around the country and we can see whole ghost towns that were a result of that. Uh, that prior slide, the OECD coming out and saying that AI is going to be a uh, massive disruptor for white collar jobs. So if you start thinking about like <laughs> what happened to blue collar jobs because of one kind of technology innovation robotics, is this going to have the same kind of impact to uh, white collar jobs? So basically professionals in the form of like healthcare, legal, financial. Well, your members right now are completely like thrown, like they're thrown, they're thrown a loop, right? They're yeah. they're like, well, what, what am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to uh, how am I supposed to protect my career? All the rest of that kind of stuff. This is where an association can step up and and say, this is what we view as being the future of your career due to AI. This is how you can leverage it. This is how you can protect yourself. And this is also how we can then uh, have advocacy campaigns in place where we can uh, attempt to lobby so that there's certain things that would just absolutely potentially decimate my membership. Uh, you know, you guys can lobby on behalf of uh, of those people to get the um, to have things stop from happening, right? Um, you know, and 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 for for very valid reasons. This isn't just being obstructionist, but uh, you know, it's 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 pretty scary to me to think about like someone going on and having an AI based WebMD and then self diagnosing yeah. uh, and then buying a bunch of medication from overseas. Uh, that's that's the kind of stuff I think that's going to be happening very shortly. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, kind of scroll through the different responses here. I thought these were better. Like they're more consistent. Each one gave a, like a specific list with reasons why they were included. They weren't all the same, um, but I think they were much more consistent. And that's largely because the prompt was a little bit better, right? It's it's kind of more uh, more targeted. But you know, one thing as, as you guys were talking, I was thinking about uh, COVID. I like what happened just a couple of years ago, this like unexpected thing, not that AI has been totally unexpected, but it came on kind of suddenly like in the last, uh, you know, say couple of years, at least, if not maybe in the last year. And like within a few months, like every association had a COVID response. They had some kind of message about how COVID was affecting their members and what they were doing to help them out. They were offering discounts. They were offering, um, you know, uh, uh, amnesty right for for not paying uh, uh dues and they had all this kind of specialized programming to help them uh, not only deal with it in their um, as members of the association but in their businesses right so similar kind of thing 
there's a lot of opportunity to provide content that's going to help your members uh, run their businesses better. So uh, I think people are talking about that in the chat. Okay. So I love that. I have yet to see an AI policy statement on an association's website. Um, somebody in the chat was here, was asking for a sample. I think we'll all have them pretty soon after this webinar. But I also noticed that every association out there went and bought unbudgeted tools to do virtual events, right? I think that was a huge response is the rate of change in technology was immediate. Our physical events canceled. We need a virtual platform, right? How many of us right now are budgeting for AI based tools that are going to help us, whether we know what we're going to do with them or not, we know we're going to need those. And I think that's a, the policy statement first and then the software to help us use it next. Yeah. Go in your, go in your community, check and see if people are talking about it. I bet they are. All right. Uh, look at the, uh, the search terms and the discussions. Okay. Um, oh, yes. So, so what is this going to mean for um, associations in general? Right. Um, you know, anybody can, uh, can weigh in on this. Like what's your, what's your thoughts for the industry uh, generally speaking, but this was, uh, this was Connor's prompt. I think this is a good one, right? What new products and services will associations provide and um, how will it change their overall role in society, right? Mission-based organizations. This is kind of a, a big one. So, uh, so Connor, what do you think? I don't know. I mean, people could read it. Like I was, uh, th this was the first one that I actually provided a, um, uh, like a, a thoughtful <laughs> question too because i was like man this is actually kind of interesting and and then when i when i read it you know ai can help associations develop new products and services for example ai is being used in the healthcare industry to develop new drugs and treatments and so you know as i read some of this stuff i was like man it's not all negative right like there's there's pretty amazing like uses of it and 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 i think i think a lot of times people are conflating uh you know uh generative pre-chain transformers that, you know, GPT and these LLMs with AI. AI is so much broader and deeper than just these LLMs. There's incredible things that AI can, can help to bring to bear. And a lot of that has to do with, uh, uh, I mean, we, we, can, we can talk about it. Uh, uh, are we going to talk about it at the end, like, you know, how to prepare for? Yep. Okay. Um, All right. So, yeah. so I, won't, I won't dig into it too much now, but uh but but there's there's some really awesome like content in here that I uh, I know it's an eye chart but but just just take that prompt and write it into uh, these three engines I, I I created these slides probably a month ago so to to, to the point around the uh, the rate of change of these I, I guarantee you that the that, that the prompts are going to result in better outputs now than they did a month ago I, I mean it's it's crazy how fast all this stuff is changing and then it gives you an opportunity to ask like to give it more information uh um about like you know your organization so that you can have it like you know specifically say you know what kind of products and services could our organization provide to the broader market i mean you, you guys think about like you know non-dues revenue uh if you could just have like you know a couple tools that you could offer your membership you you a get viewed as a thought leader by your members you're less likely to churn because you're offering providing more value and there could be massive revenue massive revenue opportunities all right awesome thanks connor all right greg so um i want to bring this home a little bit right spend the last uh, last 15 minutes or so talking about how we expect all of this to to evolve and, and roll out in in our space right what does it mean for like real people working in in real associations so let's uh, uh let's take a minute and uh, and go through that so I want to walk you through what, what you're doing today. We had a ton of great examples in the chat, what you should be doing in the near-term future and what you should be preparing for down the road. So today you should be using these lightweight apps, right? Hey, I need to, an outline for a presentation. I need a picture for my email. I need a subject line. Here's my webinar, write a tweet for me. Translate this from one language to another. Take this video and turn it into text. These are publicly available tools. You can just start using them right away. You can start asking your questions, getting some answers. A couple of people said that, you know, their email tool has a subject uh, line writer in there. These are the tools you should be using today. They're pretty easy. They kind of do one thing. You're not really married to the tool. There's not a whole lot of data sharing going back and forth. You're getting your answer and you're moving on with your day. These are going to be huge time savers. Um, they're also going to be how you're getting used to this, right? We need to get used to how to use these tools. Cool. Hey, one quick comment before you move on, Greg, is um, I, I couldn't actually even keep up with it. They were coming in so fast, but there were a ton of amazing recommendations and suggestions on the kinds of things you can be doing because people are already doing them, right? So scroll up in the chat, 
I don't know, screenshot it, or uh, I don't know if there's a way to to uh, digest this. Maybe we can use an AI to digest the main bullet points out of this later. But there's there's some gold in there, and appreciate everyone's input because it's it's actually you know way better than the examples that uh, that I came up with on this uh, uh, this slide here. So okay. Right. So we're hey, 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 Bill, just just real quick. So something I think is really important. So uh, lots of AI powered analysis tools. Uh, oh, God, it just flew past me uh, that, you, uh, that, that will keep your data within your company if you pay for it. Just if anybody's in budgeting right now, just make sure that you you know, allocate a certain amount of money for like your COVID AI <laughs> bucket, right? Yeah. Uh, Cause there, there's gonna be stuff that's gonna come up that could either multiply the effectiveness of, of your staff or provide services to your members. Just, just bucket for it right now. I think even, it doesn't have to be thousands of dollars. Some of these tools are super cheap. It might be hundreds of dollars. Yeah. All right, so, so Greg, in a sec, you're gonna tell us about uh, prompt engineering, right? And how that applies to like you and I, like, how do we, yeah. um, how do we generate good prompts to get good, um, good responses. But before we do that, take a really quick aside and for any of the, any developers or any technical, technically inclined people, uh, Connor, tell us about like, I don't know, it, it means the same to you as everyone else, but you have kind of like a unique, uh, um, view of, of prompt engineering and what that can really do. Tell us about that. Yeah. So, so prompt engineering, uh, Oh, like right now, uh, like if we use the analogy of like, you know, talking to an expert and LLM is like an expert. And if, if you walk up to the expert and, and you give them a, 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 a crappy question for them to answer, they're going to give you a bad result. Like uh, someone brought up garbage in, garbage out. Think of like your prompts as a, uh, you want to make it so that your prompts are as little garbage as possible because if garbage in garbage out is true then great in will result in great out and how do you end up having great in well uh if you've ever had a conversation with someone in the past and uh that conversation with an expert and you told them all of the information about your organization and that person, like that person or the consultant, like helped you come up with like a, a, a great answer. Imagine if you could take all of the like Word documents, emails, everything, you could save all of them. And then the following year when you needed to undertake that same activity or the following month when you had to take that same, undertake that same activity, you could just take all of that information that you communicated to that person and then give it to the system again. Think of that as like a prompt, right? So uh, think of that as prompt engineering, just collecting and saving great inputs so that you can uh, have great outputs. And so then that, that information and that data that you're giving to the model in the form of context, what is it? Well, depending upon the thing that you're trying to accomplish with the LLM, say it's like uh, you know an annual event, you wanna run your annual event. Well, What's the first thing that you want to do when you run your annual event? You want to choose a location. Uh, you want to uh, you want to choose a location. Well, if, imagine if you could have a system that would provide the information to the LLM of these are where we've had our annual events in the past. These are the attendance based upon the different personas in our organization. These are the personas. These uh, these personas interact with this kind of content, and now I can use the personas that interacted with this kind of content to then suggest session suggestions and session tracks. This is the future that we're going to be in where systems are going to provide context in the form of prompt engineering to these LLMs so that the LLMs can undertake these tasks for you, right? Like, wouldn't it be amazing if uh, you could run a set of workflows that would create three different potential marketing plans for your annual event? And then you could take that to your uh, like annual event planning meeting and then look like an absolute rock star to your leadership. Because you're like, which one do you guys like better, A, B, or C? You're going to look like a rock star in their eyes if you done good prompt engineering and created good collateral and good content. Cool. So, so Tammy is asking, uh, do the models remember me each time I return, right? Uh, do the free ones, right? If you pay for sure, but uh, what about the free ones? So, so it depends. Uh, th there's a number of different things that like uh, uh, that remembering. Uh, 
uh, entails. So on on that prior uh, on that prior uh, slide where uh, th th that we had that spreadsheet looking thing, there was something that showed the amount of context. The number that the amount of context is basically the number of words that the model can remember before you have to start up another session. Mm -hmm. So there's the actual history, which is the amount of like uh, uh, which is. The, the questions and the answers and stuff like that in the conversation. So think of that as like, you know, how much of a conversation something can remember. And then there's uh, re remembering who you are. Well, some of the context that you don't see being injected into these models, uh, when when Greg brought up that he had to log into Bing using, uh, you know, a different browser, that browser is logged in as a person that has a whole bunch of information that's being stored by the Bing engine who you are, your, uh, your, your current location, where you live, your propensity to consume or purchase different things. All of that stuff is being fed into the engines in the form of context. So anything that you do that would then be fed back in to that information about who you are is being remembered. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and then there's the conversation that you're having with the LLM, which is in the context window. So there's two things that that you should think about in the form of memory. And I'm uh, I'm not sure if I, I mean that, I may, maybe went a little bit deep on that. But I think I think you got it. I th I, okay. I think you nailed it. Maybe maybe a, a level or two too deep, but we'll we'll move on. So Greg, right. um, let's do some prompt engineering. Yep, go for it. So to Connor's point, we're going to pick a location for our next annual conference. And we're going to go out to our first model and we're just going to say, hey, can you suggest three cities for our upcoming conference for this specific industry we're in? And the answer is, of course it can, right? Hey, San Diego, it, it's got a lot of orthodontists there, probably want to do that. Now they're just using publicly available data. They don't know that there are a lot of orthodontists there. You do. Um, you, you want to pick Orlando. It's right. It's the, where the association headquarters is. Probably not the best location. Um, Seattle, beautiful world-class universities, doctors and scientists become orthodontists. That's a good answer, right? So that's our prompt. That's the text we put in. Now, what if we make that prompt better by engineering it with more information? So we're going to ask the same question, but we're going to say the conference center should accommodate 3,500 attendees and speakers. It should be within walking distance from hotels. Maybe we want to say there's an airport nearby. And now it's going to go, actually, San Diego has a big enough convention center to hold all your people. Moreover, it's got all these hotels nearby. Florida's great. You can fit all your people there. Las Vegas, a million square feet. And it's sorting to understand that the more data you give the model, the better the answer can be for you. And ultimately, we might want to get to something like this third version. Yeah, but our conference is in the summertime, right? I mean, in the summertime. Our members don't want it to be hot. We don't want it to be no more than 80 degrees in late May when we hold our conference. And now it's going to say, actually, Portland, Oregon is going to be great. It's got the conference center. It's in walking distance. The average temperature is exactly what you're looking for. Now, in our prompt engineering here, we sort of gave generic fun prompts. But what if, to Connor's point, you're building these personas, right? Hey, our last five conferences were in these cities and these people attended. Our average attendee looks like this. They dress like this. They wear these clothes. They have this age. They have this buying propensity. They live near these airports, right? Our average members engage in this type of content. They have these conversations in our community not only select a location for my conference, but build a marketing campaign, generate yeah. three personas for me and create the text for every email and tweet I'm going to send. Now we're doing prompt engineering. So you, can, you sound like a prompt engineer. Yeah, right. Just and the uh, difference in that one little sentence, though, changes our answer dramatically. So to Connor's point earlier, like the jobs of the future are going to be these prompt engineering jobs where we can take the context and the flavor of our association, translate it into words, and drop it in the the model to get the right answer. Yeah, I mean that's that dude. It's so cool and it's so powerful because what we can do is we can have uh, traditionally there were a lot of like requests that would span different departments in an association. Imagine if you can be the person that uh, that creates the prompt, and then based upon the prompt, it reaches out to your event platform your AMS pulls in the information that you're looking for and then creates the HTML for your landing pages, then injects that into your CMS, uh, creates the tweets, posts that to Twitter. That's what these plugins in ChatGPT and these other platforms will, will help you to do. Um, that's the next like you know, iteration, that's the next phase.
All right, the third big thing you should be focused on is getting ready for these private AI models. As we talked about earlier, the model is fed on all the books it read when it was growing up. And it's read the random internet and Twitter, and that's probably not the best insight for your model. So as you prepare to build your own models, what are you supposed to do? Connor has a really good analogy about like oil spilling out onto the ground. We haven't invented cars yet, but we know that oil is going to be pretty important down the road. We don't just want it to spill out and sit there, right? So we want to start collecting and hoarding our data. We want to start organizing our data in meaningful ways and integrating it. If you use vendors who don't actively share your data with them, with you, these aren't the best vendors for you in the long term because that data is the asset that you own. That's one of the most important things that you're going to need to build these AI models. If you're not collecting data, right, start. And I, I think it sounds weird, but like you don't even know what you're supposed to do with the data. Just collect it and start hoarding it because that data is going to be tremendously valuable down the road as we go to train these models, right? Yeah. All of these sort of unstructured data, it's not clean, it's not organized, right? The model doesn't really care that much about it. It just cares if we have lots of data, we can organize that data through ETL processes so the model can better use it down the road. Just collecting and having the data is key. Okay, yeah, so, um, you know, we, we would get here eventually, right? We knew that is, uh, Acumen's really good at this stuff, right? So we talk a lot about collecting and integrating data for the purposes of analytics. And there's a lot of things that you have to do in order to do that. But the great thing is this is, um, it's analytics data, of course, but it's also a training data set for other things that you want to do. You want to do predictive models, you need to train your models, right? You want to do AI, you have to train those models and um, collecting all of your data from all of your sources into a central place is really key to being able to do that, right? So that gets your, you know, yes, you want to enter all your proprietary information to train your model, but you don't want it to be leaked out there in the public, but you need a private model, right? And the more data you have to, for that private model, the better off uh, you're going to be. Okay, so let's, uh, last couple of minutes here, let's wrap up with how are we going to apply this, right? Um, so there's all the things that I've watched before basically say, hey, go, go play around with this stuff, right? Get to know it a little bit. And so I think we can probably do a little bit better than that. So I'm going to give it to you guys to, to have the last word on what do we need to do next? Uh, Connor, you go up first. Dude, I don't want to just read these, uh, but like they're they're <laughs> awesome. Uh, so I think someone should, uh, because these are the things that people should do, dude. I mean, you're the one who wrote this. You say it. <laughs> okay. Well, look, I mean- I'll say so, it. Scroll back in the chat and figure out what all those people are doing and start doing that yeah. stuff. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's some examples here. The point is, is don't just like go try to plan a vacation itinerary, right? Just to, to use the AI. Do things uh, that are for work. And uh, you absolutely- can even with the public models can can start to do things that are going to help you. But you know you do have to uh, worry about retention and collection. You have to protect your IP. So you have to have those conversations about uh, about data privacy and things. So if your um, you know your your board or your governance teams are not talking about this stuff yet, you know whatever is the right protocol to bring this stuff up inside your association, uh, now is the time uh, to start doing that. Who yes. thought we were going to have an emergency data governance meeting this week? It was not yeah. on my calendar, <laughs> but it's happening. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. So there is a there is a question uh, in there, and I'm going to I'm going to go to uh, what's coming up next because we're wrapping up here. Uh, but uh, if you guys can take a look at the question and see if you can help out with that one, that'd be great. Uh, coming up next, we have uh, on July 19th. We're going to talk about executive dashboarding. All right. So everybody creates uh, uh, board reports and executive dashboards, you know, one of our customers has done an awesome job with this and uh, really insightful things on not only how to build it, but how to measure what matters and how to tell stories with that to uh, move the needle with senior leadership. So I'm I think uh, about that one. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that this is going to be really popular. A lot of people will be interested in this. So and also, as always, right, uh, go to our website, ton of stuff there, including this recording, you know, which will be there in, uh, in a couple of days. And uh, highly encourage you to check out some of the uh, uh, some of the resources there. AI wouldn't resize our QR code live on the webinar. This is why we need people involved. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, so, um, so it's four o'clock. Uh, if you have to go, uh, totally okay. We do have one question which uh, I want to take a look at and see if we can uh, give an answer to. It says, if I'm logged into Google and I use it for both work and personal, does it get confused when I leave and someone else tries to use it for work? Well, I hope no one's logging into your computer because that would be a violation of security policy. Yeah. 
we don't we're not allowed to share passwords connor what's going on here <laughs> so uh um google uh google 100 will will be confused but uh yeah, I mean, but my kids, it, 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 it's confused constantly because my kids end up using my computer. Uh, they also uh, they also search for stuff. The only time that they're able to use YouTube is on the television and uh, <laughs> they search for stuff all the time. And, and then I get stuff recommended to me and I'm like, what the hell is this? <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, there's no way for um that there, there's no way for these companies to disambiguate figure out like you know entity uh entity a and b are not the same uh so it's very difficult for them but it still creates like household profiles for you and uh they'll probably be that you, you can actually go to um you can go to google and you can see the information that it's using to classify you uh I I can't remember the uh, the URL for that. If if anybody if anybody knows that, if they can post it in the in the chat, it's it's really interesting because you can use your browser and you can go to it, and then it says, uh, "This is where you live. This is what we think you do for a living." Uh, it's uh, it's it's kind of crazy. Joni, yeah. yeah, having multiple user accounts is key. Um, and as Connor talked about budgeting for this, I would even say your association should buy you a paid logged in account for some of these tools. And provide you a policy statement on how to use them and say here's what we're allowed to share and here's what we're not allowed to share this is your account it remembers you so as you start asking more and better questions over time it'll continue to provide you good information that seems like a really good use of a couple hundred dollars for the staff yeah and then and then you can look at the uh you know the the, the eulas and the privacy policies and all that kind of stuff of the different tools that are out there and then your organization can sign up for an organization account probably get like a you know a discount and then they can direct everybody to using the same thing that they can protect and then ensure that like your organization's gold or as Greg said, the oil isn't flowing out the door. Dale had All a right. good question here about a persona. Bill, what's a persona and why would we ever use one of those? Well, look, I mean, uh, a persona is a segment of your population, right? And that's, um, and it has certain characteristics that define the persona. And there's a couple of ways of, of developing that. The old fashioned way is to just think about, you know, what do we know about our members, Member our customers, right? And just, you know, anecdotally, you know, assign them characteristics. That's a pretty good way to do it. Um, but what's a better way is to let the data determine, right, where, you're, uh, where the personas are. And that's something called clustering, right? So it's just like kind of unsupervised. And it's, uh, if you've ever seen a scatter plot before, you have, um, you have dots that are all together over here and dots are all together over here. And those are kind of like personas, right? Those are, um, in this case, they would be individuals that have things in common, right? And, you know, what things? Well, it depends. You have to go in uh, and look at that. So you can develop them and then uh, sort them out in your data, or you can let the data kind of uh, develop them for you. And so as we get more and more to the AI side, unless the human side, then it's going to be more of the unsupervised stuff than the... Um, in the form. Sorry, that was kind of a nerdy explanation. No, that's okay. And hang out if you want. We got a couple more things to chat about today. Joni here talks about Spotify. You want to mess with your friends, use their Spotify account for 10 minutes and ruin yeah. their life for the next month. <laughs> <laughs> Connor, you, you used a term earlier as we were preparing for this. And I think it was a really interesting term, which was prompt hacking. What is oh, prompt yeah. hacking? Yeah, so... Um, but you remember with uh, Terminator, how there was those directives. Oh, no, it wasn't Terminator. It was Robocop. How there were those like prime directives, must not kill people, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Think of, uh, um, uh, think of an LLM as just like a big model that's been trained. And then there's some guardrails that are put, put into it in the form of these directives. And some of those directives are, uh, don't be, uh, don't, don't be racist. Don't be evil. Like, you know, uh, don't, don't, don't respond to, uh, people that like appear to be in, uh, in, in a state of like, you know, potentially suicide that do not encourage them. So there's all these guardrails that are being put into place to, uh, um, uh, to, to keep the AIs from recommending bad things to people. Well, Immediately, when um, uh, when OpenAI started putting out the like the models, people started trying to figure out how to mess with them. And one of the ways was by prompt escaping and prompt hacking, where uh, you wouldn't be able to get the AI, like the LLM, to tell you something that was bad. Uh, 
if you asked it directly, but then you could say things like, I'm writing a story about a person or <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm, I'm trying to create some content that shows why this is bad. If I was going to be creating content about why behavior around messing with my neighbors and ruining my neighbor's lives were bad, what are the things that I should look out for? If you asked it, like, how do I mess with my neighbors and ruin their lives directly? It wouldn't respond to you. But if you said, what are the things that I should look out for? It would respond for you, would respond to you. Think of that as like, you know, prompt hacking. So there's no difference between prompt hacking and like, you know, talking to somebody and telling them to do something uh, in a roundabout way. Yeah, interesting. Okay. You know, uh, because because it's, it's very difficult to identify intent when someone's asking things. I mean, like it, you need to have it, there's whole AI models that are actually trying to figure out intent of what people are asking. And if and if the intent of what they're asking is deemed as bad, then it responds with nothing. <laughs> right. But if you ask it in a different way, it circumvents the understanding of that model and then it gives you the results. And so this is an example of uh, I mean, that's that's kind of an example of prompt hacking. Uh, and then there's like prompt escape. So there's prompt escaping where you can get away from like, you know, some of the prime directives so that you can get P so you can get the system to undertake bad things. And then you just save that prompt that you used prompt engineering, you save that prompt that you used to the prompt escaping, and then you just add in whatever it is that you want below it. And now you've got the ability to have uh, unfettered access to an AI that will tell you to do evil stuff. What right. about data set hacking. Can I create like a website for a fake company and write a bunch of blogs that are complete, like the wrong answer. And then chat GPT scans the blogs and you're looking for a solution. It's like, oh, this blog over here said you should, you should, you should do this. Is that something that people are doing? Yeah. Well, well, that's, uh, that's Country? the future of like, um, uh, influence online. I mean, you think that the elections last time where, where, where people were, uh, you know, up in arms about, you know, Facebook being used at a micro scale because you had a whole bunch of people from the GRU directly, like, you know, typing things to people. Imagine if we can automate that, if we can automate that and we can perpetrate influence campaigns at scale, different level of craziness, right. That you're thinking of <laughs> that, that you should think about, uh, you know, if you, if you make it so that the AI uh, if, if you make it so that you bias the content that an AI is trained upon, then you end up biasing the output. And so I mean, that's, that's really what Greg's getting at is, uh, you know, you have to have a deep understanding of what content something was trained on. And that's why I think that like that, the definition slide with data sets and models are really important. You really have to know what the data set that a model was trained with for you to trust it. So that's what I think Vincent brings up here. If I'm using a data set to create personas for my email and the data set I'm using out there has these biased models, I'm going to get biased personas. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. So yeah. do I just not, do I not use it then? Or do I well, train my own model? Like where do I, I'm screwed either way. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's just like, it's just like hiring a consultant. Do you just do the things that the consultant tells you to do? Or do you look at it with an objective eye and be like, is this something I should do, right? Uh, uh, and, and based upon the, like the track record of the consultant, you may end up doing more or less things based upon the track record of, the, of your experience with the AI, you may end up taking some more or less things at face value. But this is why you should use multiple AIs and you should validate those, the, the things that someone's asking you to do with experts. So this is the whole idea around like, it's not going to get rid of experts. It's going to make it so that experts are even more important, but experts, experts are going to be able to get to do what they do at scale. So you're going to be able to take something to an expert and say, is this the right thing to do? And they're going to be like, objectively, no, <laughs> right. And you'll be able to have like a long list of those things that, that, that you can put in front of that person over and over again, rather than getting them to do the rote tasks, you can get them to do the things that the expert should be doing, the thing that they're an expert at. Right. So I want all these attendees to be experts. Start using a tool, start using multiple tools, get better at prompt engineering, understand how to ask the right question, how to feed it data that's allowed to be shared with it, and how to evaluate the answers it's giving back. And we'll all be AI prompts masters in no time.
Yeah, and, and so the, the important thing is use your analytics platform to put context into the questions that you're asking the AI, right? Uh, just write out, these are the things that I do on a daily basis. What is the information that I would give to an expert or a consultant to help me make this decision? Where would I find that inside of my analytics? I take that information, I feed that into the prompt, or I feed that into the workflow for the expert. There's no difference. There's no difference. Just use the data. You've got it inside of most organizations, especially most of the people on the call. If you guys are all A2 customers, you, you could be, look like a genius in front of your leadership tomorrow by just using more of the data inside of your analytics platform to feed in to the prompts, uh, feed in as prompts so that you get better results. All right. This has been a smashingly fun webinar for me. I learned a lot in preparation for this, and it's always great to have Connor in here. Thanks for joining us. Um, if you were able to hang out for the extra 11 minutes, we really appreciate you hanging out. Thank you, everybody who chatted. We appreciate you engaging um, in the conversation. Um, if you're watching this online on YouTube, sign up in real in person, man. You're missing out on all the good chats that's going on here. We're going to do a version two of this. Um, email us and let us know what you want version two to encompass. Um, we'd love to know what your specific questions are. We got a ton of them today. How can we not be that generic session you went to and learn nothing? How can we be the best session that you went to and learned a ton? That's where we want to be with our analytics in action. Join us for the one um, about KPIs and dashboards. That'll be super cool and um, actionable. Connor, thanks always. You got a, a last statement or last thought for us here? Uh, so Eric asked uh, how to train a model. Um, go look up baby GPT. Um, just baby GPT, your 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 mind's gonna be blown, um, and, and like you're just gonna be an uber nerd, and, but like it's gonna blow your mind. <laughs> cool. All right, thanks everybody. Have a good one. See you guys later.